Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the Joint Overview Committee on the 29th of June, 2022. Um, item one on the agenda is appointment of chairman. So can I seek nominations, please? I'm in the chair already. <laughs> Councillor Parks. I'm happy to second Councillor Sherry Jesperson. Um, any other nominations or everybody in favour? Okay. So, Councillor Parks is chairman for the meeting. I'll pass over to you. Thank you. Um, just before we start, just a few domestics. We, we had some issues yesterday where people weren't speaking into the mic. So, can we make sure that when you are speaking, it, it's close to you as possible? Um, we, when we get onto the, the main agenda item, we'll, we'll have a presentation from officers and then we'll give everyone the opportunity to. Um, ask any questions or make any points they want to do. I will do my best to um, keep a running order. There are um, some people joining from online. Um, Councillor Knox will be joining us about 11 o'clock um, if we're still going then. Um, and that's about it. Okay, without further ado, uh, we'll go on to item two, which is apologies. Chairman, no apologies, but just to note that Councillors Knox and Stella Jones will be arriving um, a little bit later. Thank you. Uh, item three, which is declarations of interest. Does anyone have any declarations of interest relating to anything on the agenda today? No, okay. Public participation, I don't believe there is any. And questions from members, we haven't received any questions nope okay and item six is what we're all here for is the library strategy development so i will pass you over thank you chair and good morning to members really pleased to be here this morning with Liz, Liz Crocker, Service Manager for our Library Service, to present our report to you today and supporting papers on Dorset Council's draft library strategy. You will already be aware that it is over 10 years since Dorset Library Service delivered a strategy, and we now aim to look forward to the next 10 years with our communities to produce a new strategy that provides a clear direction for a modern and inclusive service that is truly customer and community focused. The report you have in front of you today makes five recommendations asking you to note the extensive consultation, engagement and robust process conducted during phase one of our consultation, including the provision of in-depth research and supporting evidence created in partnership with our communities, partners and colleagues, many of which in this chamber this morning. We also then ask that you endorse our mission statement and agree the next process that moves us into phase two of consultation and engagement. Today, we bring you the summary of what our communities, partners and colleagues told us during phase one. And this is now our opportunity to confirm that we have listened. We have gathered all of their insights, and now have a truly evidence-based draft strategy framework that can now be refined and prioritised with them in phase two. We look forward to working with you this morning to hear your feedback and thoughts on the strategy framework. Chair, I would really like, with your permission now, to hand over to Liz Crocker for her presentation. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, so I'm going to, I'm sharing some slides and I will just run you through um, our process to date, some headline findings, um, which will hopefully distill some of the, the appendix for this committee report uh, for you. So um, um, our strategy development approach is, can be summarized uh, with three core elements. The, our community-led approach, a one team and partner focused approach and an evidence based approach. And the strategy detail has been developed under the guidance of our cross party library strategy steering group. 
So at the core of our community-led approach has been public consultation. And we're developing the library strategy across two phases of public consultation. And phase one was uh, carried out. Our Let's Talk Libraries consultation ran from October to January 2022. And you'll see our engagement figures on the slide. Um, we received over 7,500 survey responses and carried out 15 engagement workshops six school workshops, and 40 research interviews with non-library users. So most importantly, what did our communities tell us? All phase one consultation and engagement data is publicly available and was shared as appendix two to five of the committee report. And I'll run you through some slides which share what our communities told us. So starting with our children, um, what they enjoyed most when they visited their local library was browsing uh, and borrowing books, taking part in activities and events, and sitting and reading, uh, so dwelling in, in their local library, enjoying that time in the space. When we asked what they wanted to see more of in the future, that really focused on more arts and crafts sessions, board game or role play clubs, more space for reading, computer clubs, including Minecraft and virtual reality, so VR clubs, and hearing authors and poets talk about their books. As I mentioned, we also engaged with um, six schools across Dorset, so that was three um, secondary schools and three primary schools. Um, and on the left of the slide, you'll see our contributions from our Litchipminster School Year 8 students. Um, I appreciate it perhaps is appearing small on your slide, so I'll, I'll draw out some of the highlights. Um, they really focused their feedback on making libraries more enjoyable spaces, investing in comfy seating, making it look more modern and larger reading areas. They also offered um, suggestions for how we can improve our services. So extending the borrowing of our items to Xbox games and computer games, offering board games for, for um, access, and a broader range of community events such as a movie club. And on the right, the colorful poster drawn by our year three students highlight some of the, the ways that we can make the library more of a, a destination for our young children, including slides, a fish tank, um, a, a play area, all really um, inspiring stuff there. So we ran, uh, alongside our children's survey, we ran an, an adult um, survey. And when we engaged with our existing library users, they identified the most um, the most important existing library services to them. And they're listed on the slide there. So borrowing physical items, checking stock and reserving items online, borrowing digital items, provision of advice and information and activities and events. Um, and we also asked what would encourage a library user to go to their library more often in the future. And those top five results were an improved range and choice of stock, a coffee shop in the library, events which encourage the reuse or borrowing of items, opening hours which better suit their lifestyle, and activities, an improved range of activities or events. So if I stay with that question, with the, the depth of data that we collected during the survey, we're able to look at the different cohorts of library users and how there may be variation in their needs from the service. And on the slide here, on the left, we have looked specifically at the under 45s and on the right, the over 65s. And you can see that their needs or, does, or what they would like the service to offer is different. So the under 45s really focusing on uh, offering skills and learning, support for business growth, as well as accessing information relating to their family or children. And on the right, focusing on the over 65s, you can see that there's a slight difference as they're more interested in accessing support and advice on social care. They're, they are keen to use the library as, um, as the front door to other council services, so ac accessing a broader range of advice or support, and also valuing the library spaces to access health and wellbeing advice. And I think this, this just helps to highlight the different needs the service needs to cater for and how our customer needs change over time. So again, looking at how our library users um, and, our, and their trends in use, we found via the survey that over 90% of our library users still visit our buildings. Although a high percentage of our library users also accesses, access our services online, online access doesn't seem to reduce attendance at buildings, which indicates 
what I'm calling a hybrid library user, so someone who accesses our services both online and in person at our buildings. And this mixed economy of library use is something we highlighted in the committee report. Uh, sorry. Okay. Thank you so much. So the next slide just um, focuses a little bit more on trends. So you can see these graphs are trend lines um, running from 2016 to 2022. And on the left, it's active borrowers at DC libraries, at Dorset Council libraries. And on the right is the number of physical issues from Dorset Council libraries. These trends both highlight the, the general trend, but also really help to highlight the impact of COVID that had uh, on our service when we had to close a number of our libraries or restrict our service offer. The next slide is looking at our e-resource issues, which is obviously um, helped to fill the gap significantly during COVID. So you can see the spike that happened in our e-resource issues during the, the year of COVID restrictions and library closures. However, we're also, as we continue to recover from COVID, identifying early signs of a trend of continued use of our e-resources. So perhaps shifting some of our, our users to online and some of that remaining as we continue to recover. So we also really wanted within phase one to hear from our communities who perhaps don't often take part in library surveys. So our non-library users or, or um, community members uh, with protected characteristics. So via our, our survey, we heard from 339 non-users. Having analyzed that data, we now know that 80% of those respondents had used our services in the past. So it's more accurate to describe this cohort as lapsed library users. And this is really important as we look to develop engagement plans to promote our service, the emphasis being on reconnection rather than just service promotion. So you'll see the main reason that respondents didn't use our services classified as other within, within the service. And that really was, um, within other, there was a selection of different reasons. The highest one that we could pick out was COVID. So people at the point of this survey, Omicron was just on the, the increase. So a lot of people still considering that a risk and that was the reason that they weren't attending the library at the time. Thank you, Lisa. So 339 responses via our survey is, is very small compared to the number of library users that we heard from. And we knew that that would be the case. So we looked at how we can, um, we wanted to carry out detailed research interviews with non-library users to help add depth to the data. Um, and so via these research interviews, we presented some, some themes on the slide there. Some of the headline ones are that perceptions existed that libraries were places for books, information, DVDs, and Wi-Fi, and individuals didn't need access to these resources or they were accessing them elsewhere. So that lack of awareness of the current library offer and our breadth, so all of the activities and events that were going on for free and a range of cultural access opportunities, people weren't recognizing those as one of the opportunities they could use to um, the libraries for. Lack of time to visit a library was listed quite highly. And also feeling out of place at a library, either because of the perception of, of library behavior required and you were uncertain perhaps that maybe your, ch your children would be too loud. And I think there was still that persistent perception that there was very much a shush mentality, libraries of quiet. Um, and that's something that we are continuing as a service to break down that perception. So um, the third element of our, our approach was uh, listed as one team and partner focused. So we carried out a series of, of workshops with our partners and services across the council, and we explored how libraries can better meet local needs and have greater impact. Again, they are listed on the slide there. I will, I will talk to each of those. So building digital skills and offering digital spaces. In addition to our existing digital offer, such as digital champions and free access to digital devices, we can have greater impact by lending new tech or showcasing assistive tech, which can help routine daily tasks. And we can also improve our support for STEAM aspirations among children in extracurricular settings. The second focus on economic opportunities. So as well as currently supporting learning and literacy for our children and supporting educational attainment, we can have greater impact by working with partners to help address skill, key skill gaps, 
and we could offer spaces for co-working or business purposes. We could also offer access to business startup advice. So the next is free access to culture and cultural enrichment. Um, in Dorset, we have a fantastic track record in cultural programming at our libraries, but we identified ways that we could improve our impact by deepening our links with and support for Dorset's cultural sector and organizations, helping to build audience, audiences for a broad range of art forms. Um, sorry, if we could just go back one slide, sorry. Thank you. So opportunities to invest in buildings as community hubs. We can have greater impact by improving our co-location with partner services, which, could, which would result in enhanced service, sorry, which would result in an, an, in an enhanced service offer at library sites, offering improved customer support and an improved customer experience. Health and well-being. We can improve our impact by deepening our connection with social prescribers and Dorset's primary care networks. We can work more closely with Dorset's early years and speech and language service to, de to deliver shared outcomes. And we can also open our buildings up for use by health partners for community outreach. Within um, educating and enabling sustainable action, we identified ways we can have greater impact with, by working more closely with Dorset Waste to help in reduction and reuse and providing access to waste receptacles and providing recycling advice in addition to exploring flagship initiatives such as a library of things or a repair cafe. The way we can have greater impact with customer focused support and human help. So we can serve as the front door to a broader range of council services at our libraries. We can also support in reducing digital barriers by supporting individuals to navigate an increasingly digital world. And safe face to face spaces. We can have greater impact by providing welcoming, adaptive, and accessible spaces for all. So the next element of our one team focused uh, approach was that during phase one, we um, contracted shared intelligence to deliver our workshop program and research and, and develop research to help inform a new library strategy. What was really positive is that the research and engagement process carried out during phase one really revealed the willingness and appetite of both the council and community services to work more closely with the library service to achieve shared outcomes. And shared intelligence's report is available at appendix six to this report. They suggested four key areas for action, um, which were the four Cs. So the first being communication, developing a more effective communication that conveyed our full breadth of the service offer to existing users, non-users, and partners. Customer support. So they made a recommendation to prioritize user interactions which are relational and add value. So um, the, the human help interaction, prioritizing that over those which are transactional and those uh, transactional um, interactions such as borrowing or returning items, we can encourage people to complete them, those basic tasks digitally, enabling our staff to focus activity on activities which have the greatest impact. Collaboration. They recommended we formalize relationship with other service partners to ensure effective delivery of shared outcomes and achieve greater impacts together. And clarity, so we have identified a broad range of opportunities for increasing our impact as presented in the previous slide. Um, and they, there may be too many opportunities for us to feasibly deliver. And during phase two consultation, we will seek our community's views to help prioritize our opportunities and create that clarity with with you here today and, and during phase two. So the, the final set of slides here, I, I will run you through the phase one feedback, which really coalesced around three strategic themes. So key themes from phase one, highlighted the value role of libraries in supporting learning, speech, and literacy. The importance of resources which meet residents' interests cultural enrichment and the positive impact of library activities and events, valuing libraries as digital spaces and providing free access to digital, digital equipment and supporting the digital skill development. Libraries also as a possibility of providing space for enterprise and community spaces for growth. And libraries as enablers of climate positive actions, so including those events um, looking at reusing or borrowing of items. And these feedback points 
helped to create our strategic theme to inspire with an aim to enrich lives through universal access to information, knowledge, learning, and literacy. The next uh, collection of, of feedback themes was the need to promote the library service more effectively, building a greater understanding of the services available at libraries. And taking a customer focused approach to library service design and delivery, the need for a more inclusive and accessible user experience, and libraries as spaces of human help and trusted information. And these feedback points help to create our strategic theme to connect, with an aim to connect with and meet the needs of our communities. The next set of, of feedback was the need to provide more flexible use of the library spaces and the way that libraries can offer safe face-to-face -face spaces for our communities. The need for fit-for-purpose library buildings and the opportunity to co-locate library services with partners, as well as the positive role that libraries can play in supporting mental health and well-being. And these feedback points help to create our strategic theme to enable, with an aim to create space for our communities. And the final collection of feedback is um, the themes including valuing and investing in the development of our library employees and, and volunteers, and also celebrating all the volunteer contributions that are offered to the library service. And these feedback points help to create our st strategic theme to enable, again, but this one is instead of focusing on our communities, this was enabling our workforce with an aim to invest in the development of our workforce and volunteers to deliver services that meet future community needs and exceed customer expectations. So these building blocks of inspire, connect and enable helped us to formulate a, a really simple and ho hopefully very clear mission to inspire, connect, and enable our communities through our services. And if we effectively deliver the strategy, we feel we can, we can produce the future uh, vision, which is uh, we would generate trusted community spaces for everyone with services to inspire your future. So um, this, just picking up one of the appendix Six on, on the committee report is the draft strategic needs assessment. And allowing our services to be shaped by local need is a key design principle when developing Dorset Council's library service and strategy. This is a principle supported by the Department for Culture, Media and Sports Library Strategy for England. And within the draft strategic needs assessment we've, we've shared with you today, we've looked at a series of measures to determine where need is greatest. And in recognition of the broad range of interventions which a library service can help support, we have taken a range of measures which indicate need across the breadth of society and an individual's life course, looking at population growth, children's attainment, health and wellbeing data, and, and many more, all presented in Appendix 6. The resulting analysis has allowed us to identify libraries in higher areas of need and those in relatively lower areas of need. And within the strategy document, Appendix 1, we presented them as five tiers of need. However, it's really important to stress that the needs assessment is a, at this point a transparent presentation of the evidence. And the ranking of, of any libraries or tiered presentation of libraries contained within these draft documents does not imply an operating model assumption. The next phase of public consultation will allow us to test our understanding of need with our communities and partners. So looking ahead to, to phase two, um, the draft strategy, as Lisa articulated at the beginning, reflects um, the feedback that we received from our communities, workforce and partners during phase one. And we now need to ask them to help us prioritize. We need to understand what our outcome is most important for them and what might add the most value for them. Equally, what delivery could look like in their communities. This will then allow us to prioritize resources as a service and develop delivery action plans by spring 2023. Over the summer, we will develop our plan to develop user-focused consultation questions, presenting an abridged strategy document with embedded questions. 
and we will consult our communities and partners aligned to our customer focused principles by giving them a range of service offer examples or service scenarios. And we will look to co-design a tiered library model with our communities. The feedback and, resu and results received will inform an options appraisal for this committee to consider in the new year, along with costings. So we plan to run two surveys, one for children and one for public employees and partners. And similar to phase one, we would also plan to run a range of engagement workshops to complement the surveys, which would generate another rich data set which will be presented to the committee and support our options appraisal. So my final slide is just a summary timeline um, highlighting some of the key milestones. So obviously a key milestone being our feedback with yourselves today. Um, and then moving ahead to informal cabinet providing an update following today's discussions with the plan to launch phase two consultation in the autumn of this year. And that consultation would run for 12 weeks as recommended by DCMS. And we would plan to return to the joint, this joint overview committee in the new year and look to secure final strategy sign off by cabinet in the spring. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much for that um, comprehensive run through of uh, where we are so far and where we're hopefully going. Um, before we open this up to members to speak, I know uh, Councillor Beddo wishes to speak. Sorry, just forgetting you changed your name, just because it comes under your portfolio as a cabinet member. Uh, brilliant. Thank you, Chair. And um, thank you to Lisa and Liz uh, for running through that. I hope that um, this unusual um, joint overview committee um, have enjoyed the presentation and seen the amount of work that's gone on. Um, I think it's really testament to how important our libraries are to our communities that we have a, a first joint overview um, committee looking at this work because through this work, I mean, we knew libraries were important anyway, but through this work, we've really been able to highlight just how important. And I think um, what I wanted to highlight was the real depth of how we shape a policy um, through our communities, really from the heart of our communities. So the work that we've done on this, um, yes, you know, officers have collated and presented, but all of this stuff, all of this feedback has just come from our library users and from the people that don't but could use our libraries. So I think that's really, really important. It really is community shaping our, our work, which is what we're all here for. Um, there are lots of supporting documents, um, just to reassure you that the three of us are here. Um, if you want to delve really deeply into any of the appendices afterwards or even during, but I hope that we can keep the focus strategic because it's so important that we get that absolutely bang on. Um, and also, um, just responding to something that Cathy raised yesterday, which I think is a hugely important point, um, the public facing plain English bit. Um, colleagues will know that I am an enormous fan of plain English and how can we possibly engage our residents, our customers, our communities in the work that we do if we just use corporate waffle. Um, so we will have a plan on a page in plain English, which will be our sort of public facing, you know, uh, document that we use to chat to people about the work that we're doing and summarise. But we do need to strike a balance between the kind of corporate speak, because that's what DCMS are looking for. That's, you know, what partners are looking for. So just to reassure colleagues that we will be doing both. Um, there'll be that plan on the page, there'll be that inward facing document too, which is um, what, what we're looking at. Um, and really just to say thank you um, for, for taking the time to, to look at that and we look forward to the debate. Thanks, Chair. Thank you, Laura. Um, the way I'm going to propose to do this, because we couldn't end up quite messy jumping all over the place. So I'm going to suggest that we go and you use the three themes of inspire, connect and enable to kind of focus our discussion and then at the end, try and pick up anything else that we think has fallen outside of those three headings. So if we can try our best, I know a lot of you probably got prepared questions, if we can keep them relevant to that part, and i am probably rely on Liz to say, actually, that's not part of that bit, it's part of that question for, for a, later on in the, in the morning, um, and we'll, we'll try it that way, and, and hopefully... Uh, Hopefully it'll work. Um, so if we start with Inspire-related things, has any members got any comments or questions? 
that's thrown everyone. Councillor Ezard. <clears throat> well, it certainly inspired me because uh, in my area, <laughs> in Wareham, lots of people coming up to me and saying, is the library going to close? So that's the message they got from the consultation. They're saying, oh, are they doing this because uh, it's going to close? And I said, well, no, no, it's quite the opposite. And I am very inspired by, by your um, you know, report. It's, it's very, very comprehensive. It's very detailed. And you've got everything in there that I can take back to, to where I'm certainly area and say, no, no, we're going to actually uh, increase uh, the use of the library. And we're actually going to make sure that everybody's inclusive. And it's your library. It's our library. It's not them and us. It's actually our library. And it's there for you to use. And, and there has been improvements in Wareham Library, but, um, you know, structurally as well as other things, you know, like new double glazing and all sorts of things. So actually, I think uh, the reason that they say that is because recently there was a bit change in the policy because they took the tourist information away. And that actually made people feel, oh, dear, we're on a decline here. But no, no, I think, uh, um, you know, from what this, this report is, you, we are dedicated to actually, you know, you know, actually take it forward, increase usage of it, and make it a, a general hub. So, I mean, that's fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor Lug next. Thank you, Chair. <laughs> Councillor Lug from Ferndown North. Um, what many of you may not know is that before I became a councillor, I worked for Dorset Library Service for 22 years. So I probably have a lot of insight into um, how things are going to work. And I'm really quite excited by the opportunities this document brings us. Um, Minor more comments uh, rather than questions. Basically, let's not duplicate if another agency in that town is already giving out rubbish bins, etc. Let's not go there. Um, let's not be fixed on a building. We, we, what I don't want us to do is to get into conflict with the new um, children's... Um, it's not called Children's Centre, I can't think of the word for the moment, but the new family hubs. I don't want to see the library bagging things that would be more ideally placed in the family hubs. So let's go for something different. It's got to be specific to that area. Let's not have the staff hung up on the building if there's a need um, for deprived children in another area and we can send staff out to run uh, story time or rhyme time in another building, then let's do that. And I've got a question that I don't know which bit it sits under. So um, can I ask advice and then you can, you can tell me whether it's going to be later. <coughs> I have an issue with the way the overall need table has been done. So which bit's that going to sit under? Um, that would that's in the overarching strategy introduction and also the needs assessment. So happy to yeah. What is the point of the overall need? How is that going to fit in with our strategy? Will these libraries get more money? Will they have more hours? Because I'm looking at the way it's been worked out, and it's it's been skewed. So the libraries that have the most need are usually in the most deprived areas. But Dorchester has got in there simply because it has the highest turnover of books, people through the doors, etc. But then you look at places like Wareham and Swanage, which score higher in other areas, but don't have that waiting. But that's because they don't have the same opening hours. Yep, so um, if you're considering the, the, the list of the tiered needs in the strategy document itself, I would also advocate for considering the, the needs assessment uh, document in Appendix 6. And on page 8, you can see the, the ranking or, or the kind of 
the matrix of need when we look across the, the different elements. So there's education um, and demographic need, deprivation, health, crime deprivation, digital exclusion, and library performance or, or activity, <laughs> library demand, does form an element of that, but that's not the only consideration. So you'll see in the strategy document that Littlemore Library and Portland are in that, that high ranking of need list, and they're not open for that, that long. They aren't necessarily the busiest libraries in terms of issues, or but they are high in terms of um, social deprivation and uh, on the other categories of need. So we have taken a, a real holistic look at need and haven't just focused on library activity, because as you say, it can be very easily skewed by existing opening hours. I I'm not happy with waiting that that is given there. There's no waiting applied. Okay, did it, um, Councillor Jones. Thank you, Carol Jones, Derminster Newton. I wanted to come back on Cathy's um, comments because I, I was looking at how everything was scored, which I guess put it then into tier one, two, three, up to five. And each section seemed to have the same weighting in terms of whatever that was scored, that was scored. But I actually think areas of education and deprivation should be weighted far higher. And I think they should take priority over, over some of the other areas. Um, and I really wanted to understand what does it mean then for, say, tier one or tier two libraries? I mean, what do they get that tier five doesn't? And, and is that right, especially when we look at things like education? And I understand the comment that was made a little bit earlier about family hubs, community hubs, call them what you will. But in areas of poor education and deprivation, we probably have the greater need for a family centre, a community hub that really reaches out. And I actually feel that there should be some sort of overarching strategy where we actually, right at the beginning, just say, OK, we need to be looking at a library service together with the community hub service. So that actually changes the direction so that we're not just thinking of this as a library strategy, but as a community strategy. Um, I'll, that's, that's, that's what I think right now. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Sherry Jesperson, Hillfort, and Upper Tarrant's Ward. Um, again, going to these the two points which are, I've written down and further points that I'll come back to later. Um, I think what's coming out here is that we're not um, certain, we, we're not, we, we haven't got the depth of understanding yet about the ranking of these libraries and because my question exactly was, I'm perfectly comfortable with there being um, a tier one, tier two, and tier three libraries, so long as I know where what the tier three and tier four and tier so on libraries are going to get. There needs to be an understanding of this, the, the core service, the baseline service that we're offering, and then for the higher higher needs tier, we go up from that service not that it's just an, an ever-decreasing service. So I, I would feel more comfortable about that, about, um, uh, for example, the, the Blandford Library, which is the chiefly serves the area I represent, not being a very high tier. If I was convinced that there would be a, um, a level of service that was sufficient, not just adequate, but sufficient, to meet the needs of the people in that area because, because we do need to remember always, always, that we measure deprivation in, in, um, in, a, in broad terms and there are pockets of deprivation all over Dorset and all over our rural areas of Dorset and so we must not overlook that. So I, I would like, to, I think there's more work needs to be done on this question of what, what the um, tiering of, what the implications of, of those tiering of libraries. My second point, if I may, Mr. Chair, and this, this I, want, uh, I'm, I want to express this very carefully because let me get to the end before you don't misunderstand what I'm going to say. 
um, it's it's this question of of um, libraries in, as community hubs and the um, uh, working in uh, with partner organisations. Now, this is an approach that's supported across the council, and we hear it promoted um, as a good way forward. We, it's absolutely understood. It's what we're all in favour of. Um, in the context of adults and children's services, family hubs and everything else, and locali locality services. Um, it's also part of our community policy, but we also hear it discussed in terms of the, I'm um, on the police and crime panel, so we talk about it in terms of the uh, community policing service and, current, and uh, citizens' vice bureau. But there's a slightly nuanced point here in terms of library services being wrapped up in this approach. Because we need to be aware that in terms of the public perception of library services, if we're wrapping them up in, the, in this um, hub that's there to serve the people who most need council services, the majority of the people in say the area I represent, I'm pleased to say are fortunate enough that they very rarely need adults and children and police and CAB. And they don't, they don't see those services as relevant to their lives. And that's brilliant. And that's what we want our people's lives to be like. So, we, so I would just like to just make sure that we think carefully enough about the implications for those other parts of the library service that are not primarily for the um, uh, for the people in deprived areas. I'm thinking here of the services for um, small businesses and enterprise. I'm thinking of the cultural offering. I'm thinking of um, the borrowing of uh, um, uh, books and cassettes and so on to enrich people's lives. That if we if we if we're too quick to wrap library services up with the rest of the services that this council provides, we we will we might badge them as not for the majority of the people in our population. So can we just be aware of that? It's a slightly nuanced approach. Library services are not quite the same as some of the other services because we want them to have a broader reach. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Chair. I'll, I'll pick up a couple of those points um, for you, councillors, and, and then pass over to, to Liz if I've missed anything, because I may have. Um, in terms of the tiers that we're, we're looking at in the needs analysis, that is a very comprehensive um, document and a comprehensive piece of research that follows the Department of Culture, Media and Sports toolkit planning library services. So it's, it's a well-trusted tool that is used uh, in many library strategies. It's certainly not a, uh, a, a fait accompli. It's certainly not a decision matrix on how we're going to deliver services in every area. So it's just one of the tools that allows us to recognise where some of the areas of most need are. We're absolutely dedicated to looking at that in terms of where are the, where is our digital excluded you know, population, where is our, our, our most education need, where is our most uh, areas of deprivation. It just really gives us that rich insight into all of those communities. But its next phase is then able, enabling us to, to shape those, those future operating models absolutely um, uh, in partnership with our communities, as we've suggested. And in terms of that wider approach to one council front door, uh, multi-agency working, community hubs, absolutely, again, there will be a, a, a different approach potentially um, for, for different areas. We already have some of that multi-agency working. Our, our Weymouth li Library is a brilliant example of that, where we already have citizens' advice, skills and learning, customer services for, for, for Dorset Council, and a huge amount of uh, public feedback in the last year that we've had all of those services back up and running uh, since COVID uh, reset and reopen. But actually, I was just here for, uh, you know, to, to access the library service, and I was able to access these other services. And it's worked really well in that community. But absolutely, we need to look at how best it fits in different areas. 
and, and seeing ourselves as um, those trusted spaces that we've talked about, that access to trusted information. And whilst we might not provide that in that building, where can I go for that help? So if somebody approaches us with those concerns in their local area, or we hear something, we pick up on it, where am I going to signpost those, those people to? So where is that community hub? What is our family hub in the local area? And, and actually, we want to work with them to make sure that they signpost to us for the things that we do, and we signpost back to them for, for, for what, uh, what is happening in those areas. So absolutely working in that wider network if it's not all under one building, but where it makes sense to co-locate, where it makes sense to bring that together, because that's absolutely what the community needs, and that's what we would uh, really like to focus on and consider in the future around those community hubs so hopefully that's given a bit of nothing to add okay thank you thank you chair thank, thank you for that i think uh, councillor miller Mando, sorry wants to come in <laughs> i'll answer to both for a couple of months it's you know i keep forgetting myself um I think there's some really interesting points there, and I just wanted to touch on an event that I went to yesterday, which was meeting with our community-managed libraries, so all our volunteers, all the titchy little libraries that um, are volunteer-led, that I've got one in my ward. Um, and it was really interesting because when we talk about some of the data um, and what it means and the ability for each library to react to its own community need. When we were talking to some of our community managed libraries, they actually expressed that this is useful for them to decide, not for us to decide, but for them to decide um, who to reach out to, because they themselves might have their usual people coming in, borrowing books, doing whatever they want to be doing. Some of them um, have involvements with archives and events. Some of them don't. Um, but it, but it's up to them. Um, and it's very interesting when we talk about these documents can be quite dry and there's tables and there's so much information. But the bit that really brought it, made it sort of alive for me was when you have these people who are brilliant, doing brilliant community volunteer work, you know, um, and they can go, oh, actually, I didn't know that. And then they go away and go, hang on, we've got an idea. We're going to reach out to that group of people. We're going to go into a school. We're going to talk about the summer reading challenge because we know from some data that actually there's a need there. So the, the bit for me is the outcome. Um, and I think I, I would really want to reassure colleagues that there would always be a baseline library service. It's up to our libraries um, to react and reflect to the communities around them. And I think that this will help, um, help them to do that. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Stella Jones. Yeah, uh, a lot of my questions have been answered. I, I was thinking about it's very good that you're thinking of libraries being used for like the council's front door, but at the same time, the council are setting up family hubs uh, as the front door for families and children, uh, and you you can't have both really in a place. So if you're looking at different places, different libraries to do one thing and and family hubs to do another, that's very good. But there are, going back to deprivation, some of the most deprived areas haven't got a library. They're nowhere near a library. And some communities have actually bought community assets. They, they bought the local pub or they bought the local shop. Can we think of actually putting our library services into those community assets where we don't already have any library services? Uh, because that's extending our library services rather than reducing them. Yeah, thank you very much, Councillor. Um, thanks, Chair. That was uh, absolutely, and with regards working closely with family hubs, on the strategy document, towards the end, there is our, our strategy mapping, um, where we are trying to really keep pace and align with and take opportunities to, to deliver collaboratively um, with a range of council's priorities and strategies and, and we've taken a lot of time to, to make those connections and, and do that work and with family hubs we're absolutely we're on the um, the project group and we are working closely with them where we perhaps won't be in the, the same building. The next step for us is to then look at how we can complement their offer, perhaps delivering outreach, because we will be engaging, likely to be engaging a similar cohort of individuals. So it's, it, it might not be about that physical co-location in that instance, but it's about delivering services collaboratively together um, as we're often trying to achieve the same outcomes. Um, 
So absolutely plugged in with that and, and more generally about outreach uh, where perhaps a library may not be. One of our, our, our priorities that we're looking to explore within phase two is, is very much having an outreach um, focus within the service. So giving our teams more freedom to, to not just be tied to a building, but to go to where the need is, deliver you know, rhyme times at different locations, which, which can then increase our engagement uh, and may be able to connect people back with the library, which was, is always what we're, we're trying to, to do. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Thank you. Um, Councillor Rosard. Th thank you, Chair. Um, actually, that springs to mind. We used to have mobile libraries. Yeah, any chance of bringing them back? Uh, possibly slim. But the other thing I noticed aware of, that there is a volunteer women's group that does... Uh, delivery of books and things like that. And I, I must say, I haven't comprehensively read all the report. I'd rather have a document in my hand. Is it possible to have the document printed, a printed document of, of, of you know, so that we can really look through it? Because I know we're assessing it today, but there's so much stuff in there. And uh, I, I would like to be able to, at, at, my, at my leisure, <laughs> look at it a bit more. Yeah, I know. Oh. I know, you haven't got the printer I've got. And uh, uh, so anyway, the, it would be really useful to have it. Um, and so anyway, the, what I'm trying to say is uh, the, the uh, I know in where I'm, the women's, whatever they are, are doing quite a grand job in, in getting out to people that are uh, disabled or you know can't get to the library physically uh, and, and delivering books. But the, the other thing I'd like to say that there is a perception that libraries are still very quiet places. Uh, but I know again in Wareham, I go, I go on a morning when they have the little toddlers in and they have singing groups and all sorts of things. And we've also got a little garden at the back. So yet yeah, there is all sorts of things that are hidden in libraries that people don't realize that are there. And I think we have to get the message out lots more. I try to say to the manager there, Francis, you know, we really need to spread this large and wide. And actually, recently, you probably know, they took part in the 175th anniversary, which I'm part of Wareham Station as well. So I'm, you know, the chair of the Friends of Wareham Station. So we took part in that for the weekend. And that was fantastic to see them on the station with their friends of some sort of the library, uh, actually doing their volunteer bit about e uh, the e-service and actually reading stories to people on the train from, from Wareham to Dorchester. So that was a great um, ad advertisement and PR for, for the libraries. And I think I, that would be fantastic to do. Now, uh, going on to um, family hubs, if there is no other place in the area, then obviously the library is is the place to go. But because in some areas they haven't got other community rooms, they haven't got youth clubs, they haven't got, you know, town halls and parish halls and things, then that that really would be the place to go and then do outreach or whatever. But <clears throat> I think there is, because they're only going to do about eight or 10 of these across the county when they get proper funding, um, it, it's, it, you know, it's gonna be difficult for every library to do something. Uh, but the expertise of the library staff, uh, I don't think we're utilising it enough. And I think that's something, I know you've got development on one of the, you know, the things there. I don't think we're using the staff as much as we could. And I think we need to, you know, kind of revise that and question them about that. Because I think they would like, certainly the staff and where when I go there. I mean, I do my advice surgery there. And um, certainly when I'm talking to them, you know, they said, well, we would like to do more, but I'm not sure that we can. And I think that's something that needs to, you know, to be a forum to ask. And, and I, you know, the comment that you made, um, Laura, about, you know, the community library, especially kind of wool, I go to wool and Corf Castle, and actually, uh, you know, the people there that volunteer have got so many ideas about what they'd like to do, but very often the space is, is restricted. But I think it's, uh, you know, the report's fantastic. Thank you. Th th thank you. And I, I think, can we pick up the bit about um, the staff? Because under enablement, there is, there's a whole section around the library teams and how we can enable that. So if we can sort of park that part of it um, for now. Um, is there anything else on the Inspire bit? 
<laughs> Come on, keep up. <laughs> should, should we move on to the connect bit? Okay, anybody got any comments on that? I'm not quite sure if it really comes onto this, but I'm going to give it a shot. Um, the numbers of library users are going down. A lot of people don't feel that the library as they perceive it is relevant. And I wonder, by going out with phase two called the library strategy, whether we could rename it slightly so that we get a higher hit rate from those that don't use it, whether it becomes a community strategy to incorporate libraries or something. But actually, I think we really need to be reaching out more, to, more than the 300 odd that we managed to get throughout the whole of Dorset who don't use libraries because we need to make them more relevant. And I, I just think if we call it the library strategy phase two, I don't think we'll pick them up. I'm just wondering if we can rename it. Um, thanks, Carol. Uh, <laughs> you're, making, you're making that all face. Um, I absolutely agree that we want to hit as many people as we can and get them engaged. Um, and the team have been trying to do that with the sort of face-to-face -face interviews. Um, a couple of hundred, three, over 300 people is not actually that bad when you're talking about people who aren't perhaps interested. Um, I, I'll probably have to say, if we called it something different... DCMS wouldn't like it, the, count, the, the internal council processes wouldn't like it, but most importantly, our communities would go back to thinking that we were going to close the libraries if it wasn't called the library strategy. And, you know, as much as we want to do outreach and linking and maybe have coffee shops and maybe have co-working and business hubs and all of these great ideas, at the heart of it, what we heard really clearly from the first iteration and the first round was that people value the libraries. So I totally get what you're saying, but I, I would feel very nervous about not calling it the library strategy, but I think there probably are other ways that we can sort of really push to get that wider engagement. I think um, just, just to, to add to that, I mean, I, I'm probably on the same page as Carol on this. Uh, you need to include, like, and I get that, we need to include libraries in the title, but we... My perception of a library is, is, as perhaps Beryl alluded to earlier on, it's still someone going around going, shh, shh, and all, all of that. And, and I know that's not the case, um, but probably that, you know, I represent quite a lot of people out there that probably think the same way. So I think we, we do need to kind of zhuzh it up a little bit to, to kind of make people engage a little bit more. Um, next, sorry, was uh, Councillor Jesperson. Yes, thank you very much. I, um, I've had a very, very long-standing um, in involvement with libraries um, from the earliest part of my career. And um, there have been, since the 60s, discussions about what should we call libraries. And they've been called information centres and library and resource centres and all sorts of names. But it but the pendulum always swings back to this word libraries because it's widely understood. It's very, very highly regarded. It has one of the most solid, dependable um, in, um, uh, perceptions around the word library. It's a very, very powerful word. So my challenge is not that we dump the word library and trying to invent something else to call what are plainly libraries. The challenge to us is, is to get out to, the, to users and non-users and tell them what a modern library is. And that's what I see going on here. So I don't think the problem is in, in that they're called libraries. Everyone knows what libraries are. It's that some people are behind the, the curve a little bit in understanding what modern libraries are like. And that is, as people who run libraries, that is our challenge, I would suggest. And this seems to me a very good start doing this. Um, anybody who thinks a public library is a place where a librarian goes shush hasn't been into a public library for the last 25 years, I would suggest. So yeah, don't dump the word libraries reposition the word libraries to mean what it means in 2022, which, as I say, I think you're well on the way to doing. Thank you. Um, and I, I have been in a library in the last 25 years, and, and Councillor Lug can um, bear testament to that. Uh, Councillor Stella-Jones. 
Yeah, the people we need to attract to the libraries are young people because they're not using them very much at the moment because uh, I think they've got the impression that they are just full of books and nothing else. Um, now, when I was teaching, the library staff used to come down to the school and talk to the children and show them books and show them what else. Do you still do that? And, or, and do school trips, uh, are you encouraging them to come and visit their libraries to say exactly what is going on? Because uh, it's so important to get them very, even preschools, I know, can visit libraries and see what's going on. But then you've, they've got to come with the parents, usually. But uh, from, uh, you know, five, six onwards, they can actually come and, I think it's so important to get them at that age and show them exactly, uh, you know, you've got Lego there and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, I, thank you very much, Councillor. Thank you, Chair. Um, fantastic question. And I'm really pleased following COVID disruption, we are absolutely back doing all of those things. And I can't express the joy that our library teams have when we have a class visit. We've um, Yesterday, we held our um, launch event for the Summer Reading Challenge um, that... Oh, the number escapes me now, and I'm very sorry for that. I can come back to you with, with the exact engagement figures that we had. Um, but we, with COVID, one of the things that we are, are pulling forward into our BAU is the digital engagement we have with our schools, as well as the physical visits and outreach. Because with one author event that happened yesterday, we reached so many more schools than... Um, and my team will not forgive me for forgetting this number, so I do apologise. Um, but, but we're now having that hybrid engagement with schools is really flexible, um, and we're absolutely picking those numbers up. The, the cohort of, of young people, we have a fantastic representation, I think up to the age of under 12s. We then have, um, then attendance drops off, so we're looking at coding, um, Dorset's coding day that's coming up, working again with schools, and how we can support um, sort of the VR, the gaming, um, Dungeons and Dragons happen uh, on a monthly basis at Dorchester. So looking at how we can engage with that, the, the young people that perhaps um, don't wish to visit us after they hit their 13th birthday, we're looking at how we can, can reach out. Yeah. Um, you thought of going out to youth, youth clubs and youth centres because that's the age where they really don't want to go to libraries themselves. Could you liaise with youth centres? We'll certainly look into it. I'm not sure of the numbers of youth centres that it continue to exist across Dorset, but, but looking at that flexible outreach, I think it's that principle that we were touching on earlier around going to the areas where, where our customers are and taking the library to them is absolutely the principle we're looking to adopt and we can adopt that across a, uh, the range of our, our age age groups thank you just to clarify on certainly on the youth centers a lot of the what were ex dorset county council youth centers have now been taken over by towns villages <laughs> parishes so that there are quite a lot out there um next is uh, councillor lug I'm just thinking, why don't we um, take a hint from the local churches who say, why Jesus, why not call it, why libraries? Because that draws people in who might think, well, you know. <laughs> um, on the youth centre in Ferndown, when it was Dorset Council owned, Ferndown Library had an agreement where they um, sent books over to the youth centre and it was mainly graphic novels which were very well received over there. So that's an idea you could perhaps replicate. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Alford. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Um, Anthony Alford representing Eg Egerton Ward. And um, I just really have two questions I want to ask on this uh, topic today. And I think the first one of them comes up at this stage. And it's about the mission statement. And the mission statement uses the word communities. Now, I know, Laura, you've talked about communities and their importance and whatever. The reason why I pick up on it is because people... There are many people who use li the library service as individuals. And what I feel is that with the use of the word communities, you're assuming that everyone is a member of a group that uses the library service, 
happens, it seems to exclude the notion of individuals making use. So this is a kind of nuanced point, which I would just ask, perhaps, whether you could um, reflect on. And I think I'd go a bit further than that um, in relation to the conversation we were just having a few minutes ago. And I just wonder whether the mission statement needs to, in some way, um, present the notion of the libraries of the future, that they are different from what everyone has been accustomed to. So I'm sure that with some skill, and I'm sure it is there, there are um, some words that can be used to just express the inclusivity, first of all, and the kind of transition to a new form of libraries. So I think that's my question one. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, really, really good points there uh, on our mission statement and our, our vision as well. So our vision um, does include some of that future, you know, inspiring our future, our future people uh, around our library services. Lots of discussion around the words that we use and, and the narrative. Uh, certainly take that back to uh, Councillor Beddoe's steering group yeah. to have a, a look at that through phase two. This is all, as we've said, um, in draft and absolutely pick up your point about communities and individuals and how we really get across that this is for everyone. It's a service for everyone and we need to be inclusive. Thank you. Um, haven't got anyone else wanting to speak on this part so we'll move on to enable has anyone got any comments on they would like to make councillor jefferson um so yes so i did have um just a very general point about the our library uh, workforce, when I had a look to see who, who works in our libraries, I find it quite difficult to find that out through Delve and very other thing, various other ways of delving into this. So apologies if I'm asking some ba basic questions. All I could see listed was library assistants and yourselves. Um, so my question is, do we have any qualified librarians on the um, workforce anymore. Do we have any qualified children's librarians as opposed to general public librarians on the workforce anymore? And if not, why not? And if we, and, and the, the corollary question to that, you can answer it all in one go, is do we then, within all of this, I see that you've got, um, you, you talk about um, uh, improved training for the library staff. You talk about um, moving them around so they get lots of uh, job, job um, enrichment. Do we have in there anywhere a provision for um, career progression for our librarians where they can start with us as library assistants and go on to take their professional qualification under the auspices of Dorset Council? And once they've become qualified, do we support them with their continuing professional development through SILIP? Thank you. SILIP being the Chartered Institute for Library and Information Professionals, which is the professional body for librarians. So, thank you, Chair. Thank you for your questions, Councillor. I may have to take some of them, some of them away, um, but in terms of terms of the structure, so we do have in between myself and and our fantastic team of library assistants, we also have uh, library managers. So so uh, just over twenty three library managers um, for a number of our library roles. Um, professional qualification in the sector of uh, libraries is considered favourably, but not always a requirement. Um, we do have qualified librarians within the service and they advise, we, we utilise them in, in a, a fantastic way in that they are in the kind of a central role and they support and advise our, our library's network. Um, but we do have a fantastic mixed skill um, within the library service from 
the libraries attract a broad range of, of individuals from our communities and there's been some fantastic discoveries of filmmakers and animators that we as a service need to better utilise as well as um, perhaps the, the classic qualifications. And on, on a number of your other points regarding uh, SILIP, I will have to uh, take that away, but I'm more than happy to, to bring the answer back to yourselves. I'm sorry. That's, thank you very much, and, and I'd be pleased to hear the answer. The point, and I, I understand that you're saying that for some of these roles, um, it's not a, a requirement that they should be professionally qualified, but it, it is a way of leading to job enrichment and that they, even though they don't have to have that qualification in order to get the job, they will have a better career, a better life, and they will be uh, get much more out of the library and put much more in if we have a pathway to allow them to qualify, even though it wasn't a starting qualification. So I'd like you to uh, think about that as well. So not that they have to be qualified, but that we enable to do that through their time with Dorset Council. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, absolutely. And one of the, the key points um, that I should have made, so apologies, when, when we looked at the, the Enable theme, this was really built around the feedback and the workshops that we held with our, our colleagues within the service, and they expressed that desire for a clear pathway and it, um, for them to develop their careers not just within the service but within the council and so looking at the workforce development plan and developing the actions that can sit within this enable theme one of the key points is to develop that with our with our colleagues with our service um, our colleagues within the service and looking at apprenticeships as well the obviously the council itself um, is a, a massive advocate um, for the use of apprenticeships to, to gain new skills so that can be in, in a generic um, way we've got some of our uh, uh, I'm sorry, I can't remember the apprenticeships that we currently are supporting, but we've got a number that are due to start in September. So we're looking at that full breadth of, of how we can support that individual's development. But the detail, phase two um, consultation, the, our library colleagues will be a key part of that consultation and developing the detail with how we can make this a reality and, and what we need to do to support them. One, yes, thank you, sorry. Um, Excellent, but you, but you're you're asking the the colleagues you have at the moment, and they are seeing their career progression being outside of the library service as well as inside the. So, in other words, when you ask them uh, how do you want to progress, they see it as outside of the library service, or some of them. That's kind of what I heard you saying. Some of them do, which is excellent. But I would also like to be uh, to for us to be providing, to be the employer of choice, whereby they see progression inside of the library service. Recruiting people in Dorset is always an issue, and if Dorset Libraries is to be a, an employer of choice, one of the ways you could do that is by offering this kind of career progression, which lots of other rural areas can no longer afford. That, that's what, so yes, of course, I, I'm not for the moment suggesting that you're not doing an excellent job at the moment. I would just like you to consider this extra layer. Thank you. Thank you. Chair, thank you, uh, Councillor Jesperson, and, and absolutely, you know, all of those points are taken on board, and and, and a lot of, of progression through through the service as well is really supported. So, as apprenticeships um, are really looking at honing what we're, what they're asking for is additional skills. So, please help us to develop so that we can become the next library manager, so that we can become the next service manager, so that we can really progress in our career within the service, as well as develop skills so that we can progress our careers um, um, in, in a really useful way for communities and organisations. As they come into us, quite often they become specialists in certain areas. And when they're working with children and families, they start to create specialisms in those areas. Um, and, and absolutely, we want to retain our talent within, within the organisation as well as within the service and really uh, bring that talent forward uh, through our apprenticeship schemes and uh, further career pathways. But, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Azard. Yeah, um, yeah, a couple of things. I've uh, sort of been reviewing what had, uh, what's been done already. Uh, but certainly under the Connect 
um, and enablement, which really is all to do with awareness for the local community. Um, <clears throat> I am aware that you sell off secondhand books or books at different times that are for sale in the libraries. Is that right? Do you give them away or sell them or whatever? Uh, anyway, what I was thinking, connecting with youth centres or youth clubs, that would be a really good way of being able to donate some of these books that you don't want anymore. I don't know what you do with them, but I have seen some in Wareham Library that other people donate them to the library or they're moving them on, I don't know. But um, certainly that would be one way of connecting with uh, youth centres um, and also, uh, you know, making people aware of what's going on in the library and on bringing, bringing them in. R remember, youth centres now start a year six we actually encourage the last year at junior school, primary school, to come in uh, actually to youth clubs and then start in year seven, eight, nine. And, and really, they're the three years that we do a lot with. The year 10s and 11s are more into the environment and all the outside. We've got Planet Purbeck youth, which, which are more the older ones. But it, it really is very good to actually have things around them in the youth centre that they say, oh, pick up a book or, or can I take that away to read or whatever, rather than always be on their phones and stuff like that. So I, I, I think that would be one way to connect with those. Anyway, that's a small point, but I do think that actually, um, you know, the customer, the customer hubs that you have now for local people to go and chat, and I know in Wareham you're now putting a separate room in for, for private chats about housing or whatever it might be uh, and that is a really good addition and, and if there's room in all the libraries to be able to have private rooms to chat to customers from Dorset Council if they're Dorset Council run ones then I think that's a very good thing yeah thank you okay nothing okay uh, Councillor Starr thank you chair um this excellent report is the 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 hub of it is that libraries are changing, will be changing, and this is embraces the way that we can make them change for the better. And central to that is uh, educating the public that that is what we spoke earlier about. People know what library means. It's is it a quiet place, etc. But people have got to realise that it won't be like that in the future but by a long way. But that also will play to people who are looking to have a career in, in, in the area, it will sell itself, I hope. If people, I can understand how um, people may be reluctant to be a librarian if that old fashioned view of what a librarian is persists, but this, this will hopefully uh, play both sides of it, in, inspire the customer, if you like, and also people that want a career in this, this, um, this area. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor. Um, very, very good question, and I'm pleased that um, absolutely when we have the, the strategy in place, there would be um, one of our, our key actions. Obviously, we are consulting, would consult on the principle of this, but a, a marketing strategy to relaunch or raise awareness of, of the the more modern library offer and to go hand in hand with that absolutely as you say taking that recruitment so recruiting the right people that reflect our, our mission our values as a service and, and where we want to take that library service over the next 10 years um, so that marketing and and recruitment kind of rebrand um, is is absolute hand in hand and, and absolutely uh, within within the strategy Okay, I, you, know, I, you beat me, beat me to, to that saying that. Uh, Councillor Jones. Um, under enabling communities, they're looking for more flexible library space, etc. At what point are we, or have we, started to work with assets? Because that is going to take some time, and we need to be doing it pretty much at the same time. I would have thought. Just. Yep. Um, so. Conversations already underway um, and assets. So as part of the, the council's overall assets review, libraries are being prioritised within that so that the, the timings align to um, strategy delivery. 
So conversations absolutely started. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to jump in there because I had a, a very similar question to what Councillor James has just asked. Um, and it was looking at that assets things, have we considered, and I don't know the answer to this, are our current libraries in the right place? Very good question. Thank you, Chair. Uh, that, that is part of our, our research and our, and our needs analysis, looking at our population, where our demographics you know, are now, uh, where those needs are, where are our libraries um, located, how far is it from one library to another? Are they on a good transport route? Uh, where, you know, where are those services and where do they need to be in the future? And we're also working with, um, talking to our planning colleagues about that future development and local plan and how can we start to really understand where will future development be and how can we be ahead of, ahead of that game in understanding where future services might need to be developed? Uh, that's part of the, the, long, the longer term look at uh, where services need to be located for communities. I think Liz might pick up a... Yeah, just, just to add to that one, having time to, to think as well, it was just a, another point to, to make around the, the work that we're, we're doing with partners to keep an understanding of, of the landscape of, of evolving hubs family hubs, that, those opportunities that may sit within that and, and understanding where they may prioritise as an area that we could also co-locate with them in. So I, I think it's, it's very much an evolving picture, but part, part of phase two is hearing our partners, they can fully see now our, our needs assessment as we've identified areas of need. Does that align with they may also see our library networks as strategically placed to deliver outreach on a particular priority our network is is vast and actually when you look at some of the needs the heat maps if i call them in the needs assessment the networks i wouldn't say that there were many pockets or of high need that didn't have a, a, a nearby library and um, but i can i'll certainly reflect on that further and, and come back thank you uh councillor lug I just wanted to um, talk about Saturday stuff for libraries. So traditionally, that used to be a post for a 16 to 18 year old who would then go away to university and perhaps come back during the summer holidays. But that doesn't happen anymore because that's opened up to all ages. So now Saturday staff are mainly, in, certainly in my area, middle-aged ladies who will stay there forever. Um, <laughs> because working in a library is a brilliant job. Staff do, that's one of the problems, actually, about staff progression, that it is such a good job, staff don't move. So, you know, the, the, that is a limit to progression, basically. But in terms of getting younger staff into libraries, that opening it up to all age groups deprived a, a whole lot of young people of an opportunity and I'd like us to look at that again, if we could. Yep, I, I absolutely take on, on board your point, and I'm, I'm really um, pleased to be able to highlight one of the case studies we included in the, in the strategy, looking at our Kickstart programme, um, which was obviously a, a national programme, but we had, um, uh, I think it was one, two, three, four, four placements under um, DWP's Kickstart scheme, offered a six-month paid opportunity to 16 to 24-year-olds in receipt of universal credit um, with the aim of helping participants gain confidence, work skills, leading to future employment. And at the time of writing, I think three of those four posts then have gone on to retain a, a career at the council, either within the service or customer services. So we are committed to being an inclusive employer and, and looking at um, how we can help people into, into employment. And I think the Kickstart case study is really... Um, it, it was such a joy to watch um, those colleagues develop, and I know the teams involved with that were really, really pleased. Um, the outcome speaks for itself, but we're, we're looking at those opportunities as well more broadly across our, our network and how we can help that, the young um, particularly. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Fry. Thank you, Chair. Uh, 
Les from Dorchester West, looking at the age profile of our active users there, there's clearly a gap in there. And I, li I li hear my colleagues say, take books to youth centres. I'm not sure when any teenager last picked up a book. I wonder whether we can do a different form of marketing, perhaps through our youth centres there. Over the last two years that we've had COVID, those youngsters who would have gone to libraries to have lessons, have stories, whatever, have missed out on that. If you look at the 11 to 17 year olds, they're now into IT. We need to do a different sort of marketing for them in a different form, because they're not gonna pick up books. If I talk to my youngsters, as I print off my boarding pass, they've downloaded it onto their thing. So we need to be marketing different services to the youngsters than what we are, because I think libraries, I think books, they don't. And maybe that's what's turning them all off, which is why we're dropping out and numbers are going down. And bearing in mind, those youngsters will move up through. So if the numbers stay low, libraries won't, won't be supported. Thank you. Thank you. Um, abs absolutely critical point. Um, and I think although we, we may be able to highlight that perhaps at a different key ages, we can make ourselves valuable in that in your needs at that time. So maybe when people have a family or, or new parents, that offer we hope to reconnect at, at key points where we can really have high impact. But absolutely, your, the graph scares me as well when you look at the, the gap that we have, that lull in the middle. Um, but that, the marketing, marketing will be key for us um, with the, the finalization of, of the strategy come 2023 and how we really start to connect with our communities again. And I think at the point around um, ensuring that we have digital, digitally relevant marketing campaigns for, for that cohort of people is a really good point. Thank you. Chair, just to add that our youth centre turns out has over 200, 250 people, youngsters through every week. There's a lot of youngsters there that can be captured in a, in a workshop or some sessions there in just a week. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Starr. Uh, thank you, Chair. I didn't say um, Council staff for Upton and Lichit. Um, I'd just like to go back to your point about are libraries in the right place? I think a possibly a bigger issue than that is are libraries going to be big enough? Because of this, this report throws so many things into the ring that we could be using our libraries for. But I know in, in my ward, um, we, we're going to be a bit pushed sometimes to, to accommodate them. But, uh, so we could be making a world for our own back, but that's uh, victims of our own success, put it that way. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Do you want to come back or? It's just a, a statement, isn't it? Yeah, okay. Uh, Councillor Jesperson. Just to come back on the question of the, the um, uh, dip in users. Um, interestingly, I looked at that and I, I wasn't um, as concerned by it as, as you might think, just because it looked very, very familiar. It was ever thus that, that um, people are heavy users. Children have always been heavy users of libraries, and the challenge is to keep keep the young people using libraries. Um, uh, parents with young children are heavy users of libraries, and then older people. And there's always been this big gap. People in their sort of in their thirties, when they're not parents anymore, through to their fifties. They were never actually very heavy users of libraries, not forever and ever. And I, there's a whole range of reasons that are pretty obvious and clear about what people's lives are like. I don't think we should beat ourselves too much of, of, about that graph. I thought I looked at it and I thought, do you know, that doesn't look much worse than it would have looked 20 or 30 years ago. So I didn't find it, um, um, it didn't make me anxious. It just told exactly the tale I expected to see. That doesn't mean that there isn't a challenge there, but you've recognized that and you're on it. Thank you. Does um, anyone else have anything under the enable? I'm guessing not. Um, is there any other general points that councillors want to raise any questions about? Councillor Alford. Anthony Alford, Egerton Ward. We've had 150 pages of text to consider this morning, and the word entertain is used once. I wonder if that is enough. Okay, we'll we, we take that, and I'm sure that that 
that comment's taken on, on, on board. Um, any, any other general comments before we conclude? Councillor Lugg. Um, just a couple of things. Uh, Dorset Council has a new programme called Best Start in Life. The local alliance groups are looking at the effects of COVID on the under fives. And I'd really like uh, this strategy to tie in with the findings of that and how libraries can help in that. And the other um, area that we might want to look at is we considered the new proposals for Dorset adult care yesterday and there's a huge opportunity for libraries to be giving out information on um, what that will mean for our residents. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor. Um, I'm pleased to, to update that I attended the Best Start in Life steering group last month or earlier this month and it's it was a really exciting meeting to be at because it's it's strategies being developed at, at really um opportune times um and so those connections are absolutely i'm forging we're forging ahead with those um and and absolutely um yes and with the best start in life we'll, we'll be doing pursuing a similar approach thank you thank you uh councillor jones Thank you. I, I was just contemplating um, what Councillor Jesperson was just saying about how fam there's a dip and families tend not to use. And it might have been ever as was, but if I look at the people that are coming through to the pantry, these are predominantly families that are going through all sorts of struggles and strains and all the rest of it. And actually there are resources and help that they need. And they are exactly the sort of person that the, they are the people that should be going into the libraries to get extra help to find out whether, how they can access, can they get a bit of help with the council tax? Is there a benefit they're not claiming? <coughs> how on earth do they access the educational system for their child that hasn't had a diagnosis? So this is, this is a crucial part of the demographic that we really must be, now whether we do that through community hubs, family centres or whatever, but actually right now, we're not dealing with them. That's the situation as it is right now. Okay, th th thank you. I, I, sorry, Councillor Rezard's first. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just a general comment really uh, is that I think uh, uh, you know, the libraries are trying to be all inclusive for all age groups. Certainly the dementia friendly Purbeck uh, use it, um, the one who wear them and Swanage. And I think that uh, we need to actually encourage that more, especially if you've got libraries with little bits of garden and things, they love getting out in the garden. Or, or you know, uh, around where we've got allotments as well. But this is to do with, with inclusivity. And I think that's so important that the staff can cope with that and they get the necessary training. But also, what I'd like to say, I saw... Uh, uh, um, something I think was on the BBC that said there's an increase in people reading books, not necessarily from the library, but going to charities and buy, buying up second-hand books. 47.5 million books were read over the last, over they reckon the COVID period. So that, that uh, you know, and people say, oh, well, it's all going digital. That's actual books. That's not online or Kindle, it's actually physical books. So that is apparently is an increase. I don't know what the usual thing is, but that is phenomenal when you think we, what, what was the uh, uh, our population? I think nearly 60 million now. So you're covering a lot of the population if that's the case. So I think that that's uh, quite a nice thing that uh, some parts of the population are actually really avid book readers still. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. I, I didn't know if you wanted me to pick up Councillor Jones's point on, on our customer access points um, and bring those much more into the libraries and, and plans for how we really do look at how, how much more information we can get out there about what, to, what you can do in your library, how we can work and include more of our citizens' advice points, uh, income, income maximisation, absolutely working with um, uh, the cost of living uh, crisis Dorset Together Working Group, libraries are absolutely at the heart of, of that, ensuring that we can really support 
customers with all of those journeys, whether it's just a bit of support to get online and make an application, or whether it's actually one of the, the rooms that we, we are developing within our libraries to have a, a confidential conversation with, with a specialist officer. So uh, we're in four of the libraries at the moment with customer access points. We want to we want to make sure we get that right. And in the smaller libraries, you know, at least that initial point of contact and signposting as we talked to before. Where can I get that help? How can I really um, be supported on that journey uh, to get that that support that I need? Um, and in terms of, of reading books, um, absolutely. And I think um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of information out there at the moment about. <coughs> switch we all spend a lot of time on screens now switch the screens off and reading a book is 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 actually a huge health benefit so uh you know absolutely an advocate of sitting down and reading a book rather than looking at a screen thank, thank you uh, councillor jesperson just very briefly just i'm so glad you said that councillor Ezard, because um the death of the book has been predicted hasn't it since the printing press was first invented and it's um and there was a um i don't know if any of you listened to the program on radio four about one good thing that you can do one thing you can do to improve your health and there was one that was making me dance around my kitchen the other day when it was saying one good thing that anybody can do to improve their health is spend 15 minutes a day reading not just a book but a novel, it's about the reading of stories that is apparently so very good for our health. So it's been widely recognised and the book is having a bit of a moment. So that's brilliant. So please don't assume um, that libraries have gone digital because it's very much about the book. And to the second part of that um, point is that, and this is a thing that we are all now becoming more aware of, is that we used to talk in terms of the um, uh, digitally, the, the, the people who were not digitally enabled, that time would take care of that, and that as people got older, they will have grown up with the digital world, and so fewer and fewer people would be, be left in the, 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 the tail of people who were not digital would get smaller and smaller. Time is now demonstrating that that is actually not true because as we live older, live longer rather, we become older. People in their 90s are, find that they, they struggle to keep their digital skills up to date. And, and that's a reality that we are only just discovering. And so the, the non-digital cohort all across the council, people who need non-digital services, actually it won't diminish over time. It will remain static or as, as we hope people continue to grow, to live longer, um, that small cohort might be with us and might grow. So, I, so the future for libraries is not wholly digital. Um, it is about books and it is about people. So yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, Councillor Stella Jones. Yeah, uh, just to remind people that we do have uh, uh, residents in Dorset who have English as a second language, um, and we want to encourage them to use the libraries. How do we cater at the moment, and how could you make it easier for them to cater to use our libraries? Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor. Um, so we have a wide range of, of books in world languages available both in hard copy um, that can be requested via our catalogue, but also online. Um, so our e-resources also, we have over 30 world languages available there. Um, in terms of um, ESOL or English as a second language and, and those um, uh, learning opportunities. So we work closely with Skills and Learning, who are obviously co-located at a number of our libraries, um, to promote and signpost their courses that are available. Um, and we've we've also recently undertaken some work to clarify, and it's one of the actions in the plan, um, but with world events that has been brought forward um, in terms of our refugee um, support and offer um, as a library service, both supporting our staff to understand what we can offer um, refugees who, who may um, attend our libraries and also working with partners as part of Dorset Together that libraries are represented at that table and we're, we're increasing um, English as second language courses over the summer. Councillor Ezard. Just comment on that, but there, there is apps on your phone, and I am <laughs> I'm social thing, that, that actually do translate 
So sometimes you can talk into the phone in, in English and then press a button and it will translate it into other languages. Certainly on WhatsApp groups I've got with people all over the world that they speak Italian or whatever and I just press the button and it translates it. It doesn't always make sense, but, you know, <laughs> what how? Uh, but, but yes, it does make things simpler, uh, certainly uh, if, if you've got that sort of facility. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Are there any other comments from members before we draw this to a close? Okay, thank you. I think that's been really, really productive. Um, can I just ask members, are we happy that we move that the five recommendations in the report um, are accepted? Everyone happy with that? Thank, thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, thank you, everyone, for your input. Thank you um, to you two, to Liz and to Lisa. That's been fantastic. There you go. Um, okay, um, just to go through the, back to the agenda, if we may, please, before we get euphoric about going home. Uh, item seven, there are no urgent items and there are no exempt business. So um, thank you all very much and have a safe journey home. <laughs>